So the first point is that, um, uh, bring us back to naturalism, uh, there is a view out there, not in this room, that if materialism is true, then um, uh, life has no meaning. Uh, that's to put it in the starkest terms. I mean, so we know, uh, this is especially in the West, a 19th century sort of uh, reaction to, many people say, so Max Weber talks about the disenchantment of the world uh, and that uh, the, uh, the evolution, besides sort of uh, uh, environmental problems and uh, 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 political problems in Europe, there was also this idea that the movement from there just being Naturwissenschaften, now that's interesting because there's magic and mystery to nature and we're discovering what it is, but then with the growth of uh, the uh, Geisteswissenschaften, right, the, uh, the spirit sciences, that's now getting spooky because you're starting to sort of uh, explain human behavior with the same uh, principles. And this, um, so this familiar refrain that we hear that we uh, get in, in Weber uh, and uh, uh, and other people, we see the same kind of, it's kind of vertigo, it's a kind of uh, um, existential anxiety to the idea that we humans might be, and this is in the wake of Darwin and other people, right, uh, that we might be 100% uh, uh, animal, as we all in this room uh, think, and that our fate is that of, uh, of other uh, mammals. And of course, clearly just given, I don't think that there's anything intrinsic to the reaction of thinking that that's intrinsically depressing, but obviously in terms of an antecedent a set of cultural traditions which say that the entire meaning of life has to do with how you fare, as it were, after you die uh, and are judged, and that you will be judged largely in terms of the moral quality of your life. So this is one of the ways of uh, connecting it up. Uh, we make, still make jokes, we naturalists write about what happens, Alex was telling some this morning, when you get to the pearly gates and what St. Peter says to you and things like this. I mean, so this is a, a, a very familiar uh, way of thinking of, about ourselves. So, so what is the, uh, so this is just a, back to what Dan talked about yesterday in terms of, this is a political um, kind of issue, but it also has, uh, I think, um, uh, it's a project that we naturalists have to be sensitive to, that we have to uh, find a way of speaking and saying things that are, as I put it, upbeat and not depressing about the meaning and significance of a human life given that we're finite beings living in a material world. We're finite material beings living in a material world. And when we're done, we're done, maybe. Oh my God, my comes to mind. No, sorry. Uh, actually, Frank Jackson's review of my books was about Madonna. He said, call me material boy. But uh, <laughs> so, so that's kind of background. And I think that's just, as I say, it's a sort of a cultural, uh, uh, no. Um, so, but now I want to just jump back and, and, and ask this uh, question. So we talked about the um, uh, fungibility of, con of moral concepts and the difficulty of uh, locating them and grounding them um, in firm, on firm soil, subspecie eternitatis. It doesn't look like that's going to be what we're going to be able to do in morals. And I think similar problems will, will occur when we try to give uh, naturalistic views of meaning. But I'm glad Don um, brought up his, um, I think, uh, excessively optimistic view about what the uh, game theoretical approaches could give us, but I now want to uh, take us back 2,500 years and just connect the morals and the meaning issues. So Aristotle says, um, he goes around uh, Athens, uh, not actually Athens, I think he was going all around Greece, I don't think he was housed in Athens most of the time, but he says, I ask people what they want that they want for its own sake, that they want for nothing else. This is a, just a question about psychology, right, uh, first pass. Um, so a lot of things they want for instrumental reasons, like they want money because it buys them stuff um, and, and so on and so forth. But what do they want for non-instrumental reasons? And he kept, keeps getting this answer from his compatriots. They want eudaimonia, which I put on the board. It's a, uh, it means something like EU means good and daemon means spirit. So it means something like happy spirit. And actually until about 1975 when I was a graduate student, it was translated as happiness. But then uh, people... Yeah, but that actually changed in around 1975. Uh, uh, John Cooper at Princeton actually started to say, no, that's the wrong word because, um, well, he doesn't say this. I say this. Aristotle says, even if a, pers if a person dies and you give the eulogy at their funeral, you, even if you know all the facts about them, you can't declare them eudaimon, that would be a, a flourishing person, until you see how the grandchildren turn out. Now that's kind of interesting because it means that whatever, that at least the conception that he saw in his culture, okay, of human flourishing was not just subjective. It had to do with, in some sense, the 
the not forever effects that you leave, but some of the effects. Well, we says something about his discount rate. Right? Well, okay, that's right. <laughs> okay. Sure, okay. Um, so I think this is important and interesting. I mean, he's just, he's reflecting on where Greek culture had gotten circa 400 BCE in terms of what are things, what kind of things are important for making a good human life. And um, so now the, um, and so the, the question I just want to um, have us uh, reflect on, and I think it, it comes up in spades, I mean, and it gets us into the areas of purpose and design and maybe emergence. Even if evolution is purposeless or non-teleological, there do seem to be creatures like us who are planners and make, uh, have desires and make projections about how we want our life to go. I don't, think, I don't mean this in anything like a blueprint sense. I just think we all have senses of what we want to accomplish. Sometimes it's only what we want to accomplish next Thursday. Sometimes it's what we, you know, especially when we're young, we want to finish university. We then might want to go on to some other school. We want to work in certain ways. We want to do this and that and other thing. Um, so um, Aristotle uh, says there are very few constraints on what he notices that people have different views about uh, what constitutes purpose, meaning, and flourishing. He says there's only actually one thing he detects that everyone says, and this might be a constraint from human nature. He says, no one would ever choose to live without friends. Meaning, he's doing sort of sociology. He just says, I just don't find anyone like that. Um, some people think it's a good idea to go off to the mountaintop for a while. Some people actually do think a life of contemplation is the bomb. Uh, some people think a life of uh, political power or reputation. Uh, all the same contenders we have now, sex, drugs, rock and roll, they're all contenders. He says, I see people like this, but they all agree on one thing, that they would never want to live a life without friends. And this then leads him to, to say more things. And, uh, and I don't want to uh, go into um, what Aristotle says. But I think what, um, what I want to ask us to reflect on as naturalists, uh, and this is why I say it goes along with, uh, it seems to me, uh, and some of the discussion this morning was like this, there are multiple goods, and they're heterogeneous, and they're not easily unified. So just to speak in the way Stephen was speaking, uh, the, the, the sort of normative view that I prefer, and if I had world enough and time, I would try to convince you of, is that a good human life is a life lived at the intersections of the true, the good, and the beautiful, all with small letters, not platonic <laughs> ideals. These are just like, it's good to know about what science says. It's good to uh, be around uh, beauty. And uh, it's good to uh, be around morally excellent people, as we define morally excellent. But those things sometimes compete. And there's no algorithms uh, about how to uh, figure them out. Now, the question is, is there, though, anything that we can say that's reasonable about what kind of things make a, good, a human life um, good? And here, I, uh, I, so I've been pushing the, this idea for a few years, what I call eudaimonics, which I like the word better than happiness studies or well-being studies because it's a Greek cipher and no one knows what it means. <laughs> and Jeffrey Sachs is trying to push it. Uh, we were at a meeting with, about before a whole bunch of measures about human well-being were brought to the UN uh, back in March last year. Uh, the idea being, so here's the idea. It, it, could there be such a science uh, and what would it look like uh, a science that's descriptive and normative. They would tell you not only sort of what is producing various kinds of well-being, but also make, uh, give you information that one could use, either individuals or political groups, about what would do better, uh, make you better down the road. And I'll just give, there's already stuff like this going on is the point, and it's among people like us. So there's some work on doing hedonic measures of well-being. These are just seeing how many units of pleasure you get in a day. You can carry around your pleasured hedometer like you could carry around a pedometer on your waist, but you have to press it. And some people just look at, do subtractions at the end of a day. How many happy moments do people have compared to negative moments? And this seems to be a measure of some kind of state that people like. This is literally people walking around with that. Yeah, yeah, Dan Kahneman actually does hook up people with these things sometimes. So for example, you know, you find not to pick on the Brit in the room, they're only one. I mean, a, a Brazilian who has 18 positive uh, experiences in one day and 16 negative ones is a plus two. They are about as happy in some of these hedonic measures as a Brit who has three positive and one negative because it's both plus two. <laughs> so this is just, this is like pretty primitive social science, but the point is, and they do find these huge differences between cultures, okay, in terms of, but those are, those are one kind of experience. But obviously, that's not a measure that captures what most of, uh, at least many of the things that we mean by flourishing, because if we think about things like 
you know, was Mar did Martin Luther King Jr. flourish or did Gandhi flourish? We don't think about it. We th I think we want to answer yes. They led purposeful, meaningful lives. But it wasn't because of the hedonic units. And this comes out in, like Dan said, you're, if your best friends are doing just that, then there's a problem. There are these then subjective well-being measures, which a lot of people use, uh, you know, asking people what are the most important domains of your life and how are you faring in terms of them. And then there are these objective measures. So for example, you know, Dan Kahneman will talk about the, you know, the flat line that occurs after people make, it's a moving target, whatever it is late now, 100,000 is what I heard at this meeting. Across the world, once a, once a family of four is at 100,000, okay, then there's no increase in well-being with the more money you have. There's increase in other things. You can buy stuff, obviously. Um, or, uh, for example, if you ask college kids um, uh, how important is making money to you, uh, and you divide the groups, in American colleges you get this, about 50% will say it's the most important thing, and about 50% will say it's second or below, and it turns out that the ones who say it's the most important thing need to make twice as much money <laughs> to be at the same level of well-being later on. Mm -hmm. So when I give this talk, when I give a talk about this stuff to students, I say, you should work on yourself to make yourself not desire money, because it'll fuck you up in this particular way. Um, and uh, so that's just a way of, I mean, I just use that as an example of where you can use some information about what, how people get on hedonic treadmills, make themselves miserable, and then you can make recommendations about if you want your life to go this way, then it would be better to. And I take that that's continuous with some of the recommendations that were being made about how we conceive of moral knowledge and how we use practical wisdom. But, but so the idea here is just to connect up what I've just been saying is a way of connecting up both considerations about how we want to do our lives, what will make our lives good and meaningful ones, uh, by thinking about natural resources, uh, historical resources, uh, sociological, psychological, economic, whatever is there. It's just use all the knowledge that's out there, um, and, uh, but it's natural knowledge is the point. But it's highly fallible. It doesn't ground anything with certainty and so on.